Ponzi. Good evening, everybody. I'm your host, Jody Taylor. I'm coming to you live from the beautiful North Bay, Ontario. Today has been a great day. I've been looking forward to watching this evening's performances all day. <laughs> I have a background in the arts myself, and I'm a graduate from theater. With that being said, I understand all the work and dedication it takes to keep these stories alive, and I'm so proud of each and every person that is a part of bringing these stories to life. With that being said, let's get into our first half of tonight's performances from our vision and voices. Tonight, we will have the show's H.E.R., written by Kitsune um, Sole, and performed by Pesh Napus. And we will have War Shirt, which is written and performed by Joel Chief Moon. And our final show will be The Bridge, written and performed by Pesh Napus. Awesome. Let's get into it. Thank you. Welcome back to the H.E.R. Show, Healing Existential Reality, a spicy little corner where I give you tips and tricks on how to improve, shall we say, your life. In our first installment of our continued exploration of human dynamics in relationships and self-esteem, you are introduced to our human doormat, Clementine. In a full examination style, we put this woman in a petri dish and took a peek into her toxic relationship with her domineering mother, her equally toxic work environment with which she remains in the claws of that dreaded beast, Dragon Lady, aka her boss. In this segment, we'll explore friendships and ooh la la romance. So stay tuned to see how Clem strikes out in the friendship and romance department. My bestie's name is Dahlia, but everybody calls her Doll because, well, she's a doll. When we were kids, People would always say, she's pretty as a doll. You know the type. Porcelain skin and always prancing around in cute little dresses with perfect little bows. We've known each other since forever. We've been through thick and thin. She's basically like a sister to me. Can't really pinpoint it, but She's also kind of evil. Not like super villain kind of evil, but feels like she's my personal evil saboteur. Because all of the worst decisions I've made in my life so far have been made either because of her or with her influencing me in some type of way. Like, she tells me that I need to constantly be checking my partner's phones. Just in case, Clem, you don't want gonorrhea. She planted the seed that I can't trust anyone. We used to shoplift as teens, but I grew out of it. Last year, we got caught at the mall. She had a couple of shirts in her purse. They were gonna charge us both, even though I didn't take anything. But. In epic Dahlia fashion, she talked them out of it and got a slap on the wrist because she's such a doll. <sighs> then don't even get me started on her judgmental opinions. She's always at me like, Clem, don't tell me you're wearing that and expect me to walk beside you. You'll look like a clown girl. Who helped you with your makeup, Ronald McDonald? I don't mean to rag on her. She's my bestie, no matter what. She claims to be my bestie too, even though everything we do is about her. 
like I said, lately, I'm not really sure she's got my best interests in mind. But again, it's not like I have a shit little friends I can pick and choose from. Anyway. I still love you, doll, even though sometimes you're such a bitch. I really hope she doesn't see this vlog. She probably won't. They say keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Well, with Clem and Dahlia, you might wonder which, if either choice, is wise for Clementine, as far as her friendship with Dahlia is concerned. Let's take a look. So, tell me about him. His name is Cedric, and he's got those key factors to make all the girls drool. Ugh. Tall, charming, great hair. Not my usual type, but you know. No? Go on. Okay, fine. So, he's absolutely dreamy. He's kind of your type. Shut up. Fuck me, then chuck me. Worsens my daddy issues. Ding, ding, ding. He's got total fuckboy vibes. But you know, he's got something so charming about him. He grew up the youngest of four siblings. They're all girls. So he's got this charismatic feminine thing about him. Like he's got this insane emotional intuition. Like he knows what I'm about to say before I say it. Weird. I don't know how to describe it. So what's the catch? I can tell you're calculating in your head. Catch? He's the catch. I don't know. I can't place it. I think it's just that he broke up with this girl recently. So like, I'm not sure if he's completely hung up over her or not. Well, I can crack him open. Let me meet him. I'll do some fishing. Really? Okay. Uh, we're going to this opening on Saturday. You could just bump into us. Maybe your date ditched you, but you decide to go anyway. Yeah, that wouldn't happen. Men don't ditch Dahlia. But being the strong and independent woman that you are, you don't need a man. You just showed up. Come on, it's a foolproof plan. All right, all right. But I hope you plan on wearing something better than that hot mess. Rude! Well, with a friend like that, how could Clementine go wrong? I think we can all imagine that all kinds of things go wrong with a friend like Dahlia. Why? Because, if we're being honest, most of us have had a friend like Dahlia at least once in our lives. You know what I'm talking about. That friend who always makes you work just a little bit harder for their friendship. That friend who always seems the hardest to find when you need them the most. That friend who needs you when they need you. That friend who you complain about because they treat you like shit. But you keep going back for more. And what about L'Amour? Love. That mischievous, blind, winged baby. Where has its arrows landed in Clem's love life? His name is Cedric. You know, every time I think about how we met, I smile. He had this contagious laughter and we crashed into each other, full on bang, into each other's reality. It was so surreal. He was so attentive. He really paid attention to the small details about me. 
He studied me like a book. It was like he was trying to pass the test and call me his own. And he did. He passed that test. I'd say his best physical quality is his hair. He's just so dreamy. Ew, I hate saying that out loud. His worst quality? Cedric has a talent for constantly making me feel like shit about myself. Like nothing I can ever do is good enough. No matter how on point or on cue. There's always got to be something wrong for him to tear me down or pick it all apart. But the sex is good. But I can have good sex with anyone. And maybe it would be better if I found someone who just loves me for me and doesn't scrutinize every action, every meal, even my damn playlist I make. Then I remember he's my manager. Oh my god, I almost told that to Doll the other day. She would have freaked. Are you really gonna let some loser you just met take control of your life, Clem? I haven't told her that we've been seeing each other for like six months though. Whoops. But you know what? He's really good at that. All the management's done. And in that respect, we're a perfect match. So, is it really worth it to start all over again? He's got his hands deep in my business, and he's good at it, so... When I try to pinpoint the exact moments of when it all started to go downhill, it's like this weird matrix of complicated actions. I know he's such a toxic asshole, but he's also so sweet about it. Sometimes I think I just make it all up in my head. I had to write down some instances though in a calendar just to prove I'm not crazy. Tell me you're brainwashed without actually telling me you're brainwashed. Is Clementine crazy for being that into Cedric? We're not here to judge, but merely to present the evidence and let you be the judge. But before you get all judgy, why don't we hear what Cedric has to say about Clementine? Where do I begin? She's hot, she's curvy. She's got a lot of ambition, which is what really attracted me to her in the first place. She's got all these ideas in her head. Some of them are shit, to be honest. But when I give her that push in the right direction, then she's gold. Like, she's trying to do all these influencer things. And I really helped her fine tune her style. She got that from me. Clem has been getting these brand deals, so I had to swoop in as her manager. I just know a good opportunity when I see one. I wouldn't say that I love her. I like to live day by day. No point in planning out a wedding or any of that shit. She's a bit clingy. She wants too much commitment. I'm not ready for that. As soon as my platform starts taking off and the honey start coming in, bye bye, Clem. She's the one who was chasing after me in the first place. I like my women with a bit of sophistication, a bit older. But I took a chance when I saw her potential. God. She really needed my help. She was always dyeing her hair all these crazy colors, and I told her she'd be so hot if she just went back to natural. So I guess you could say I'm the one that did her the favor. Look where she's going now. 
She wouldn't be getting any of these brand deals without me. Tonight, she's dragging me out to meet her best friend, Dahlia. She calls her doll. Anyway, she talks about this shit constantly, so she finally talked me into meeting her. I can only imagine what she's like if she hangs out with Clem. Clem wants me to act like it's by accident when we meet up a doll. So now we're really playing make-believe. But a guy's gotta do what a guy's gotta do to keep baby happy. Cedric puts the ick in dick. Anyway, we've all had our problematic relationships and friendships. Am I right? What will happen though when Clementine's worlds collide? Will Cedric and Dahl hit it off and rule Clem's life? Will they hate each other and in turn make Clementine's life a living hell? Tune in next time to find out what can happen when besties and boyfriends meet for the first time in the next installment of the H.E.R. Show. didn't see you there, but I could sure smell you. <laughs> I kid, but welcome, welcome. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Nafi Oldman, and it is my extreme pleasure to be here and to be given the opportunity to show you what we are working on for our upcoming exhibit, Forgotten Peoples of the Northwest American Plains. Personally, I wanted to call it Colonization leads to ashes and piles of dust, the exhibit. Or better yet, the white man gets what he wants, the Canadian retrospect. But I was outvoted 59 to 1. However, I did manage to talk them into showcasing these lovely and rare pieces of clothing. I hoped I could convince them on the merits of their cultural significance and history. But I think the biggest selling point was all the money they could make with this exhibit. Yeah, when I mentioned the money part, it was the best idea ever. So now, here I am, uncovering the rich histories of these precious items that chronicle the hopes and dreams, victories, and tragedies of the Blackfoot nations of the Great Plains. Now, you might have seen some in other museums curated by colonizers or in collections that belong to very rich white people, never on the backs of the real people or the Nitsitabi, as we called ourselves. Almost every Blackfoot family had lost them, but in reality, they were either stolen or traded for something that was worth not even half its equal in value. Stolen and traded, hung up for public viewing, just relics of the past. That's what the colonizers would have you believe. That's why it's my job to reinterpret these artifacts, to reveal the voices and stories of my people buried beneath the veil of conquest. It's my specialty. I have my methods, which are my secret. I tried once to show them how I uncover them, the stories buried beneath, but no matter how hard I tried, they were not listening. So I thought, fuck it, and kept it to myself. So what we have here is a war shirt. But this is not just any run-of-the-mill war shirt. This war shirt is one of the rarest. It's in one piece, impeccable condition, and not as fragile as most are now, which means it was made long after the ones that predate first contact. And 
unlike most others. It's made from more than one material, rather than just buffalo buckskin. But like the older ones, it's decorated with images of the wearer's history, their ancestral history, personal history, and of course, all the major battles and victories are recorded here. It was a living symbolic record and protective talisman, a living testament of the valor and triumphs of the Blackfoot warriors. They were usually made by the women of the tribe, be it the grandmothers, mothers, wives, aunties, sisters, nieces, and were often decorated with animal talismans, which consisted of either bear claws, horse hair, feathers, etc. And these were often for protection, strength, and other mysterious powers they may want transferred from that animal. Also, human hair could be found present. Sometimes family gave hair willingly, and sometimes a defeated enemy, not so willingly. And of course, these symbols you see here were often made from porcupine quills, paints made from berries, earth, and blood, and then later beads. Each shirt had four stripes, one along each arm, and one across each shoulder from back to chest. Now, this particular war shirt is special to me because when it caught my eye, it seemed to speak to me. So I grabbed it, which wasn't as easy as it sounds but I knew it was important for my research. And I decided if I had to, I'd do a little snatch and grab. All for the good, you understand? For the good of my people, for the good of all people. That's what my research is all about. That's why I study this and share it with you. Each image tells a story of the wearer each image is imprinted with their DNA. Think of it like a canvas of the person, a portrait of their life story. And so this image here is the oldest and here is where we begin. This image was born of a dream and that dream has been shared by many. The spirit of the buffalo, clear as day, white as snow. The hill, the prairie, is this real or am I dreaming? Not long ago, I asked for help. Everything was falling flat. The spirits were unwilling to help me, to help those who needed helping. It's time to renew our peace again with the earth and the creatures, you and I and all creation. But the tree, the center pole, will not move and does not stand. The fires will not light. And there's no smoke to lift us up. So I ask, what's wrong? Are you just testing me? Are you testing all of us? The sun fell. The moon was red. And all I felt was nothing but dread. Then, like a thunder, there it was, the spirit of the buffalo, clear as day and white as snow, upon the hill in the prairie. I closed my eyes, I think the high above, this was right, and on this journey, you'll be with me.
I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. I'm grateful, I'm grateful. Creator, creator, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. Can you hear me? Creator, can you hear me? I'm grateful, I'm grateful. Those bastards, those. Where the hell am I? No way. How did I get here? I, I wasn't even thinking of where I was going. I, I just had to get away, to get away from. I always find myself here, usually walking aimlessly through the city. I realize that I'm here at the bridge. And here I am again. What am I doing here? Looking for answers in the water, listening for soft whispers when the wind caresses on the leaves. I should go to the police. And then what? Tell them what happened. Then they'll start asking questions. Questions that I don't know if I can answer. Feels like a dream. No, a nightmare. But back there, back there, I just wanted to sleep because I saw him in my dreams. And usually in my dreams, he's always ahead of me. I can never reach him. He wants to show me something, but I always wake up before we get there. But this time he stopped and showed me a way out of the nightmare I was in. I'm grateful. 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 Creator. Creator. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Can you hear me? Creator, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Those bastards. Those. Where the hell am I? No way. How did I get here? I, I wasn't even thinking of where I was going. I just, I just had to get away, get away from. I always find myself here, usually walking aimlessly through the city. I realize that I'm here at the bridge. What am I doing here? Looking for answers in the water? Listening for soft whispers when the wind caresses the leaves? I should go to the police. And then what? Tell them what happened, and then they'll start asking questions. Questions that I don't know if I want to answer. Feels like a dream. No, a nightmare. But back there, back there, I just wanted to sleep forever because I saw him in my dreams. Usually in my dreams, he's always ahead of me, and I can never reach him. He wants to show me something, but I always wake up before we get there. But this time, he stopped and showed me a way out of the nightmare I was in. I've got to make a decision now, and, and I've got to think, about what I'm going to say if, if I call the police and, and tell them what happened. I mean, I think I'm screwed if I do, and I'm screwed if I don't. I mean, what do I say if they ask me about, you know, like how it happened, and, and then I'd have to explain my life. Endless nights of stumbling home drunk, waking up and doing it all over again, stuck in a never-ending loop. Wine, vodka, cheap beer, weed, coke, and meth. Only lines, never smoked it. Best part about meth is the euphoria. 12 hours of nonstop fun. The ritual, I crush the shards into a fine powder, use my expired credit card to shape the lines, snort. It burns, but I like it. People think I'm doing coke, let them think that. I love my secret. 
flying high for days. The worst part, coming down. Feels like death because basically at that point, I'm just running on fumes. Can't process what anyone is saying. And the anxiety, I hate, hate, hate the anxiety. Feeling the world closing in, heart beating a mile a minute. Only way to stay sane is to walk to the nearest liquor store, music blasting in my ears, and buy the cheapest vodka on the shelf. Drink it straight while promising myself that I will never, ever touch vodka meth again. Just like when people wake up hungover and say they'll never drink again. Then the next day they're down at the park guzzling wine right out of the bottle. Uh, drowning my sorrow straight. Chasers are for wimps. I love how it burns my throat, the warmth of my belly, the way my head feels stuffed with cotton. My family doesn't like that I go to bars by myself. Good thing they don't know I drink alone too. They might think I might become an alcoholic. <laughs> I shouldn't be drinking. You're not supposed to mix alcohol with antidepressants, are you? Does everything really happen for a reason? When you look back, you think, Wow, I should have done this, or I shouldn't have said that. Can't change the past, only learn from it. Honestly, I don't know anyone who's actually done that. How did my life become this, this messed up? I mean, I was a good kid, decent kid. Did my homework, my chores, didn't stay out late, got good grades, a good, happy kid. Yeah, that is until high school, when I couldn't help compare myself to all the pretty popular white girls with their fabulous Hollister, American Eagle, Lululemon. But let's get real. I can never fit in with those white girls. And the other Native kids in high school, a handful maybe? And they were a tight clique that all went to the same elementary school before they got to high school, so I was never going to be a part of that either. I just didn't fit in anywhere. Still, I was a good kid. But why? Why didn't I fit in? Because me and my brother Cade were adopted by our white parents. So as a result, I didn't know any other Native kids growing up. I had no idea what it was really like to identify as Native, and the other Native kids knew it. Our parents tried to bridge the gap by taking us to round dances. Mom made me a jingle dress when I was six or seven, and we'd go to a powwow and I would dance and dance and dance. I loved all the colors and the singing and the dancing. I loved it so much, I brought my jingle dress in for show and tell. Grade two, I walked proudly in front of the class wearing my jingle dress. The little turds tormented me. Woo -woo -woo -woo. Brown girl, dirty Indian. Why don't you wash that brown off your face, you stupid engine? The teacher told everyone to shh, but that didn't help in the schoolyard. Never wore that dress again. Stopped dancing too. Mom and dad did their best, but they didn't understand that taking us to powwows wasn't gonna be enough to connect us to our native heritage. How could they? They never raised a couple of native kids before. They didn't have a connection to our culture. So it seemed foreign to us, like we were visitors at those powwows. Felt disconnected. Wanted to feel something, anything. And now I'm here, running, hiding. What should I do? What should I do? I know what I would do. You know, when things start closing in on me? Okay, I've never told anyone this, it's secret. When I was 12 in grade seven, I discovered a way to escape the pain, you know, the pain of, of, of rejection, of, of feeling empty. It's a secret, but I found a way. Oh shit, is that one of them? 
<laughs> yeah, I can't use that as an escape anymore. My dirty little secret, my little death. Because now I know what death's face looks like and, and, and I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful for everything. But that, but that's where I first discovered a way to escape. Grade seven, first love, Brayden. He was really, 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 really cute. And I was really, really, really shy. Oh, I obsessed over Brayden. If only, if only Brayden and I could be together, then everything in this stupid world would make sense. So I asked my best friend, Sabrina, who I trusted, to ask him if he, you know, if he liked me. I waited after school for Sabrina to tell me what he said. Then I saw them together, walking in the hall, holding hands. I know, it's just kid stuff, right? Puppy love. But I was just barely holding on, and it crushed me, smashed me into tiny pieces. I feel nothing, a void. Sitting on the edge of my bed that night, staring at nothing for hours, achingly numb. Then something I read. Was it a book? A magazine? It doesn't matter. Something about cutting. I want to try it. I take scissors out of my pencil case. Brayden and Sabrina walking in the hall, holding hands. I drag the scissors across my wrist. She locked eyes for a second. What are you doing? Doesn't hurt, barely even scratches. We're supposed to be best friends. I want to see blood. You bitch, you stole him. Need to feel something. My eyes fill up with hot tears. I turn away so you can't see them. I want to see blood. Try again. I want to see blood. Persevere. I want to see blood. Push harder until the cold scissor blade finally pierces. And I see little beads of blood. There it is. Pain. Pleasure. Whatever it is, it's satisfying. A soothing distraction from thoughts of betrayal, insecurity, worthlessness, loneliness, but always come back. So I continue. Yeah, the first cut is the deepest. But, I can't go back to that now. I can't go back to the booze, the drugs. I can't go back. I can't go back. And I can't let them find me. Hello? <clears throat> Hello? Hello? Can anybody hear me? Hello? Is there anybody there? Please, I think someone's holding me against my will. Please, somebody help me! I think they're gonna kill me! <laughs> well, I'm just having difficulty here with my prompter, but um, I did enjoy watching those three performances. I hope you all enjoyed it also. Um, we're just setting up my screen here. <laughs> Technical difficulties, they do happen. Um, so I would now like to say thank you to all the viewers that are joining us today. Your support is very important to everyone here at CIT. So with that being said, I would like to mention that this is a pay what you can show. Your donations fuel our programming for our students and helps us provide the best education possible. If you are interested in donating to CIT, 
please click the link in the description or I believe in the comments. Donations of any amount are welcomed and greatly appreciated. We are now going to move along to our final performances of the evening. This portion of our show comes from our Arts Digital Workshop. This is CIT's first step in expanding on our existing virtual programming by offering an intensive month-long workshop that taught participants the basic skill set required for performing arts and digital video production. Tonight, you will get to see five short films created entirely by our participants using their newfound tools and equipment at their disposal. During these performances, we ask that you find the link in the comments in order to vote for your favorite performance. So let's check it out. Hi, my name is Ben Reed, I live in Toronto. I make East Cree from Iran, Saskatchewan. My project is Hunter's Journey was created with the help of my family and CIT. The story of a hunter that meets a crow asks you, and the crow teaches the hunter about tradition. The Arts Digital Workshop helped me develop the skills possible to complete this project. Thank you, enjoy. So you have to help me. The cops are after me. I don't. I don't know what to do. I was hunting, and he gave me that just day, Mal. That usually I do, but I just forgot today. Come on. Really? What do I do then? Be better get a shot him. What door? A shot him. Chop us a sick or stick on. Okay, I'll believe you. Okay. Get the fast sick or stick on. Keep us. Get the fast. Get the fast. Get the fast sick or stick on. Keep us. Get the fast. Get the fast. He's again. Keep away. Keep away. Get the fast. Be no go swallow. Coming, do you hear squirrels? I know, I know. Why is it all dark in there? Born with the victory. Okay, I'm going in. Born with the victory. What do you mean? What do you mean see you on the other side? Thanks for helping me. Starving. Do you have any food? Here, meat so. Get my coat and cold. Not that one. Ah, so. Here, I ask you. Then again. Fix my boots. Hey, 
that's not fair. It's that bus, do you me? Two way. Pass to me. before you kill me. Why do I always come up with different clothes? And why in the hell am I here? Ugh. I don't know. The door changes your clothes. I said looks like pastumi. <laughs> it's chocolate. Read that book. In the past, Animals spoke to each other, who have lost that gift. This gift was lost due to the cruelty of the people. It is said, when this gift is returned, a new era will begin. The gift is... Where, where's the rest? Where, where is it? I can't be it. Go talk to the animals and it'll tell you what to do. You got to leave through the bottom door. Keep bats. Go talk to the animals and it'll tell you what to do. I'm going now. Bye. I was me, Sagan, and good luck. Hi, my name is Lisa Lakey, and I made the short film Dear Canada, which reflects my experience as an Indigenous person in the colonial world we live in today. I'm very thankful for CIT and the ADW program for help teaching me the tools and programs to bring this story to life. Thank you. Dear Canada, when the world thinks of you, they think of this wondrous free place where there is no hate there. Everyone is polite and friendly. People get to come here, start fresh, and have the life they've always dreamed of, escaping horrors of war, genocide, and having that chance to start over. Before you were born, we lived in a just society, one where women were not only treated with respect, but they were the leaders. We listened to them, we respected them, and helped out our neighbors and family. We used to respect our environment and thought of the seven generations before us and the seven ones to come. Then you came. You saw us as less than human. You did everything you could to destroy us, to kill the Indian in the child, as you put it, to deal with the Indian problem. You took it all from us. You stole it from us. Dear Canada, many relatives of mine and my great-great-grandfather fought against you in the Northwest Resistance for their land that was promised to them. The RCMP, which was formed to oppress our people, burned my family's home down and killed our animals to starve us. But we survived. You shamed our people and told everyone we were traitors. My grandfather moved to London, Ontario when he was a teen. He didn't get to grow up in his culture. You stole our future so that other people could get one. Dear Canada, why do you provide the bare minimum when it comes to educating the next generation? Why in a 14-year public school education are my ancestors mentioned once in a one-week period? Nothing mentioning the true horrors they experienced and sugarcoating it to seem that it was a positive relationship when Europeans came over. We learned all about Germany and the horrific genocide there for months and months, ignoring the fact that Hitler got inspired by the genocide of Native Americans. 
ignoring the fact that our people fought for you, Canada, in the wars, for you to give them no credit and to rip them of their homes and people when they returned home. You allowed people to laugh at me when I told them about my grandfather. There is no way you are native. You're the whitest person I know. You sent me to Western University, where in my first week my grandfather passed. Weeks in, having a student on my floor from Northern Ontario go off on how disgusting and dirty native people were, and having no one defend them, and seeing everyone nodding along in agreement. Canada, you made it so that someone from my hometown tweeted how furious she was that someone asked if she had native ancestry, that she was ew, disgusted, anyone would associate her to be native, all because of her dark hair. You made it so that people stand up against racism elsewhere, all while normalizing the racism towards indigenous people here at home. That when a group of Inui students came to my high school for an exchange, all I heard the whole week were racist and degrading comments. I was silent then, but I heard it all, and don't forget. Dear Canada, when I think of what you did and are doing to our people, it truly breaks my heart. When I think of the lies you fed most people. You've poisoned the average Canadian so they don't know much of us and have no exposure to our culture or the true history. You let them believe that we steal their tax dollars and get free handouts. So that when they see homeless native people on the street, they think they are lazy and deserve it. Or they'll even go and burn down homeless shelters made for them. They don't understand that reserves were made to be prisons. They don't understand that you've given us less than 0.2% of your land. That you made our healing ceremonies illegal. That you banned us from voting until after the second war. That we fought for you. They don't understand, Canada, that you've used every possible resource you had to kill the Indian in the child, to have the media paint us as savages and brainwash people in the education system to wipe everyone of all guilt. Canada, you've been alive for 150 years. We were here for 10,000. Yet you act like nothing was here before that, so people can come here and feel proud of the country they're in. It was built on the bloodshed of our ancestors, and we don't forget. You tried Canada to kill us, so that people like me and of my generation wouldn't be here, or be assimilated to not see themselves as Native. You almost had me. You almost had me buying into the belief that I can't be Indigenous, that because of the way I look, it's impossible. But guess what? You didn't realize the power of our culture and the beauty in our people. The ones who've welcomed me with open arms and are teaching me my culture. It was my grandfather and all his ancestors before that that belonged to this beautiful land called Turtle Island long before you were here. Once I realized what you did, how you tricked me, how you made me believe with blood quantum measures that I wasn't enough, I am doing everything in my power to make sure my children know the truth. I will and we will not let our culture die. You tried, but you failed, Canada. We are still here and oh, we are rising. When I think of my future children, they will grow up differently than I did. They will know our family's history and be proud of where they came from. They will proudly say they are Métis when asked what nation they are from. They will not have their culture ripped from them and made to feel shame on that. They will think of the seven generations before them, and I know seven generations from us. They will do all they can to make sure we are here. They will be the caretakers of our land and learn the traditional ways. They will respect their elders, care for their neighbors, learn our songs, and connect and be there for the community. They will fight for our people until the wrongs have been made right. They will learn of our ancestors with pride and always know that they are indigenous to this beautiful home we call Turtle Island with no help from you, Canada. Sincerely, Lisa. Hello, bonjour, Annie.
My name is Carly Stasco, and I'm here on Lake Nipissing on the traditional territory of Nipissing First Nation. I've been living here for the last two years with my sons Forest and River and my husband Trevor, but I come from Toronto, to Toronto, Ontario. My relations are European and Indigenous, and I'm quite disconnected from both of them, and part of my journey has been to reconnect with my heritage and my ancestors. My efforts to connect with my Indigenous heritage have been challenging because of adoption and factors outside of my control. But as I continue to pursue that, what I have been able to do is work at learning Anishinaabe Moen, making meaningful connections in community, and trying, if it's possible, to be a responsible settler on this land. I was so grateful to be part of this project to connect with amazing teachers, organizers, and participants. It meant a lot to be able to connect during a time when I felt really isolated. My piece is about decolonizing my body through movement on the land and healing in public. Thanks for letting me share it with you. Miigwech. <laughs> I remember being amidst falling tear gas canisters. I saw circles of people who were peacefully protesting, just being pummeled with tear gas. Everyone had picked up pieces of stone and they were all banging on the metal because they needed some kind of way to resist, to show their resistance. I just knew the truest thing I could do was to dance to that rhythm. That is my warrior saying, I am here, I am human. I was not born to fight you. I was born to live and be free. And this is me living and being free in the face of your tear gas. react. Sarah, a song you can suggest we play on the radio? Oh, well, okay. I, uh, I'm going to suggest James Brown, Get Up Off of That Thing, because the lyrics say, get up off of that thing and dance till you feel better. That's what I've been doing. I don't know if you've got the social media app, TikTok. Tick, 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 tock. She's been filming, videoing herself doing this, putting it up on TikTok, and I gather it's quite the sensation. You just keep dancing like nobody's watching. It was just one day walking after the kids had finished virtual school. I went out for a walk along the lake and was listening to music, and I just started to dance, and it was such a release, such a release. And I just started to dance, and it was such a release. There's a, a woman from Toronto who's now living in isolation in the woods on Lake Nipissing during this pandemic. She homeschools her kids and to stay sane, she dances on frozen Lake Nipissing. We're trying to treat this as an adventure and, and trying to help the kids see the positive side. During this pandemic. I felt free to just dance. Our moods were really low and the, certain, the future seemed quite uncertain for us, especially because I'm immune compromised from cancer treatment cited. And thankfully I, I was cured then and since I've had my kids and, and a good life. When the pandemic started, it was almost like revisiting some of that because I had to kind of go back into being isolated because of my immune system. I just started to dance and it was such a release there's a lot of tension in the world these days and it was it's a very private lake so nobody saw me and I, I i felt free to just dance finding a way to spark joy and keep morale up carly stasco and her family are dancing their way through the covid 19 pandemic do you have good moves carly like what do you look like I on the ice <laughs> Oh no, I just found out that a bunch of local ice fishers have been laughing at me for dancing outside. Yeah, she definitely just had her COVID shot. She's cracked right out. 
Middle of Lake Nipissing. One of them had videoed me dancing and had put it up in a private Facebook group and they were all having a good laugh at me. I thought, am I going to stop dancing? And I, I thought, no, I, this, is, this is keeping my spirits up. I don't care if I look weird. A woman and her family in the North Bay area are dancing their way through the pandemic. She and her kids have been regularly shaking off all the stress through the power of dance. Through the power of dance. Through the power of dance. They to spark joy and keep morale up. Spark joy and keep morale up. Sasko and her family are dancing their way through the COVID-19 pandemic. It changes your mood. And I kind of forgot about that until... We were out here isolating during the pandemic. Like a lot of people, it's been hard. Now she wants to help others who are struggling with isolation and the pandemic. We have to look out for each other. And I guess my way right now is by healing in public. And if being in my body and, you know, dancing and not being embarrassed and just being in the moment, trying to get through a difficult time. If doing that can also help other people do it, that's great. It doesn't matter what other people think about you, and that it's just great to dance, and that I hope other people join with us. Dance like no one's watching. I'm a little embarrassed that these folks are laughing at me. Is it really that bad being embarrassed compared to the other challenges of life? I reposted the post from the Fisher Folk to my TikTok and uh, and went to bed and the next morning woke up and discovered that it had gone viral and it had been shown to hundreds of thousands of people <laughs> and the <laughs> and the response was all so positive and encouraging the messages i've got from lots of people have been to say you know what i'm going to try that too or you just keep dancing like nobody's watching that really warms my heart So dance like no one's watching, even if they do. Life's too short for shame. You just got to be you. All right. Sarah, a song you can suggest we play on the radio. Oh, well, okay. I, <laughs> I'm going to suggest James Brown, Get Up Off of That Thing. Because the lyrics say, get up off of that thing and dance till you feel better. That's what I've been doing. Hello everyone. You get to know me. So I just shared with you that my Oneida name is Yugatsununi, meaning that she's happy. And my English name is Kathleen Dockstader. I'm from the Bear Clan and I'm a member of Oneida Nation of the Temps. I am very thankful to everyone tuning in this evening to watch our videos as I'm very proud of the work that I had put into my video and it was very fundamental in my healing journey um, going through a traumatic experience and um, utilizing some coping mechanisms that um, you know were, were healthy and having faith and that's something that I continue to have within my daily life. And I'm very thankful to all of the people involved in the program and all the talented instructors and program staff. They were very instrumental in teaching us so much and supporting us and encouraging us. And I'm just so thankful to be a part of this program and I hope you enjoy my video. Thank you. The bond between a mother and daughter is the strongest bond I know of. The unconditional love, the side-by-side -side support, having such a strong mother-daughter relationship has been a blessing in my life and has helped me shape who I am and how I navigate this world. Oh, hey, Carly. Hey, what's up? Yeah, I'm just uh, getting some work done. Yeah. A lot of work to do before exams. A lot, a lot. Um, wait, I think I have another call. I think I have another call. Okay, um, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Hello? Yeah? Are you serious? Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll be there as soon as I can. Thank you. Bye.
have everything? I don't know. I think I do. Okay. think about the good things there's power and positivity but that often comes with a harsh reality check that things are going to be hard i just need you to be okay mom i just need you to be okay i need i need to see you again healthy and well and i just pray to the creator that that's something that will happen in the near future i just need my mom i just need my mom i love her so much it's not it's not time it's not time no i don't think it's her time It, it, it can't it can't be her time please creator please let me have more time with my mom please I'll never again underestimate the strength of prayer and the importance. After three long months in the hospital, my mom was able to come out of the hospital again and have these beautiful memories that I'm sharing with you and travel and live life to the fullest and just be present and share the love that we have with our family. Uh, it's been such a wonderful blessing to have more time with my mom and that's something that I'll forever be grateful for. Sego. Gatsitsi and Hari young gats. My name is Gatsitsi and Hari. I am a Gaingahaga woman. My name means she carries the flowers. It's kind of poetic, isn't it? But it means my hands are always full. I carry, I hold, I juggle. I try to exude the joy, the freeness of moments. I try to bring laughter in this world and just fun. I try to give others just a bit of unexpected sunshine to their day. I love with all my being. I give my whole being. There's always the flip side. That darkness that overwhelms you, consumes you. That weight that I carry. My flowers wilt in the darkness, as do I. I sink back into the earth and I become brittle always carrying these things with me. I don't have time to pick out my dead flowers, so I'm holding on to these traumas.
Sego. Yeah, I'm doing okay. How are you? That's good. Yeah, yeah, I'm alright. It's been two months, but I still feel different. Like, I'm empty. <laughs> it's like something is missing. I... I have a void within myself, but it's gonna be okay, like, things happen, and I'll heal. I, I know I'll never be the same again, or get over it, but it'll get easier to cope with everything that's happened. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, um, well, I'll see you soon, okay? Okay, been a wrong class. Anna. Flowers need a little water to grow. This is for you, Gonwatsi Sieni. You will be my little girl with a flower. Such great performances. I have absolutely enjoyed my evening tonight with all of you. And we are now at the end of our showcase. I would like to give a huge thank you to our partners and our funders before we leave. To Philip Geller, Lindsay Sarazen, Tay Alvis, Ed Roy, Kitsune so so Sole. Kofi Aduro, Dorian Shine, Grand River Employment and Training, Endeon Aja, Wolf Eye Productions, Octopus Red, and also our funders, the Department of Canadian Heritage, Canada Council, Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council, Toronto Foundation, Mizuwebik, Bank of Montreal, and the Ontario Arts Foundation. I hope you all had an amazing night. I know I did. So we hope to see you soon. Have a great night. <laughs>